Shalom everybody. My name is Liraniel Siegel. I am so happy that you're here joining us today on this show. There's so much I have to share with you uh, about my personal testimony of how God touched my life. And we're going to have a guest on. His name is Stephen Khouri. And he's going to share about his testimony and how God has been using him with the Arab community here in Israel. So stay tuned and thank you for joining. So I just want to share with you a little bit about my personal story and uh, introduce you to how God touched my life. I was born in, into a believing Messianic family. Uh, my parents are both Jewish believers in Yeshua and I was raised uh, right outside this valley in a place called Mevaseret Zion. Very early on I was taught all about the Bible and, and about Yeshua. So I had him in my life very early on. A lot of struggles came into my life, you know. Um, I had a lot of people bully me at school. I was a bit odd, you know, I didn't really listen in class. I, it was very hard for me to stay concentrated. But I just had this uh, weird uh, sense of, of darkness in my life. I would have so many nightmares at night, just of uh, snakes. And <laughs> early on, I had a big fear of snakes for some reason. And you know, um, at the age of nine, I almost committed suicide. I uh, almost gave my life away because it was so hard for me. I felt so uh, desperate for love and acceptance. And my parents were traveling all the time. They were constantly going back and forth, doing ministry things. And, um, you know, sometimes that's the ramifications of having uh, parents that are musicians and they travel. You just, uh, you don't get as much attention. And that's okay. I had au pairs and they still treated me with a lot of love. Uh, my parents always supported me, whatever I did, you know, I was uh, into dance at a very early age. And uh, later on, uh, God saved me. I didn't end up killing myself because there was something that kept me here. There was a voice that kept telling me, if there's a hell, you don't know where you're going if you kill yourself. That was the first time I think God spoke to me in a sense. Now that I'm older, I see it that way. And later on, um, I would try to find acceptance in different ways at school. I, um, I actually had the opposite happen to me. I started becoming popular. A lot around the wrong kind of people, just people who were really bad influence for me. And so I started doing the wrong things. I, I became anorexic and bulimic at the age of 12 and 13. Uh, I threw up a lot of my meals. And I had a friend that was with me in it, and uh, we kept each other's secret. And I would wear these baggy clothes so nobody could really tell that I was skinny, like bone skinny. During that time, my mom had uh, breast cancer, and a lot of that affected me even more because I was trying to find love in different ways. Obviously, that wasn't the answer, but it just got worse from there. <laughs> So I, I started to look uh, for love in guys, and um, they took advantage of me in many ways, and I let them because I didn't know how to say no, and I didn't know what my value was. I didn't know that I was precious. I didn't know that my body uh, was a temple, and that God was the owner of this creation. And uh, I didn't have that self-value and self-respect, unfortunately. That brought to a lot of pain and grief. At the age of 15, I went on a trip with my parents to Scotland and Ireland. We went to this conference 
and this pastor named Reinhard Bunke, crazy, um, amazing pastor, he was speaking about the fire of the Holy Spirit. And I remember never in my life have I ever heard someone talk with such fierceness and boldness. And the moment he spoke of the fire of the Holy Spirit, I was glued to his words. I just wanted to know what that felt like. I wanted to know what it felt like when God touches your heart. And I ran to the stage <laughs> like a maniac. <laughs> I ran to the stage because I was so hungry to be freed from the darkness, from the depression that I had in my life. And that moment, God touched me. He touched my heart like I've never had in my life. And all that anorexia and all that bulimia and everything that was wrong with me and everything that was broken in that moment, in that instant, was just taken away. It was, it was a miracle. Like, nobody could do that in my life. No matter how many people tried to tell me, like, there's a hell. You need to get right with God. You need to walk right. You can't be a lukewarm believer. It didn't matter what people spoke to me. What mattered was that God spoke to me personally. And unfortunately, <laughs> even with that life event happening to me, uh, that year was amazing, obviously. I had um, amazing experiences with God, miracles that I've never seen before, people being healed miraculously. A boy with, a, with an arm that's short, uh, his, I saw his arm getting longer. God used me to pray for him, and I saw it happening in front of my eyes. I couldn't believe my eyes. Uh, I saw a demon-possessed person being freed from a demon. At the age of 15, <laughs> I couldn't believe these things, you know? It was just so beyond my wildest imagination. Yeah, a year later, unfortunately, uh, I was very hurt from the believing community. I felt like people judged me and didn't accept me. And again, that feeling of rejection crept back into my life and took me away from my personal relationship with God. And I let that happen. And I found friendship again in the wrong areas with people who weren't, who didn't believe in God and people who they just didn't know wrong from right. And I was a bad influence again on other people. I would have parties at my house when my parents were gone and doing ministry. I would invite people over, people would get drunk, I would get high. Uh, it was just like, a, it was just a, the, a lifestyle that I lived. I was always out of the house, so I was always running away. I went into the Air Force. I had a very hard time there too. I hurt myself during that time. I got medical leave for a little bit and then I went back in. After the Army, I just tried to figure out what is going to make me happy as a person. You know, and so I started chasing the world. I started working hard. I worked a lot. I made a lot of money, uh, but none of that satisfied me. I um, smoked pot every day because I wasn't happy, so I was trying to find a way to release my, my sadness and, and gain happiness in an artificial way. But it wasn't long-lasting. It was always I had to get high the next day and the next day, and it just became a ritual in my life. And I moved to the States, I moved to New York City. I was around 23 years old at the time. And I went to an acting school called uh, Lee Strasberg Theater and Film Institute. I, that was a great experience in my life, to be honest, but so much uh, of what I was acting out in the theater um, was bringing up pain from the past that I didn't know how to deal with. And I got into a really unhealthy relationship during that time in New York. I met this guy. I thought it was love at first sight, but it wasn't. That was all a deception of my heart. And there's a verse in the Bible that says that the heart is deceitful above all things. Who can understand it? And that was me. My heart was so deceitful because I was in so much pain from the things that I went through and the things that I brought on myself too, but things that also the world brought on me that I didn't know how to deal with, with what I was feeling. And I just thought, well, this might, be, this might be what I was always looking for, for real love, right? And uh, I went into that relationship submitting to that man. <laughs> and I gave him my all, and I thought I was going to marry that man. During that time, again, I was smoking weed every day. I was very lost, and the weed started to not have an effect on me. I would smoke some of the strongest strands there were, <laughs> and none of it worked on me. 
and I would just get super sad. I would get into deep, deep, dark thoughts. And I would always look for God at those places, even when I was high. That's when I knew I felt like God had left me. And that's when I started to look for God. I was broken. I had no money anymore. I wasted all my money on drugs. <laughs> I wasted it on the wrong things, you know. I didn't have the ability to understand the value of what I had. I wasted it all. And just like the prodigal son in the Bible, I was a prodigal daughter. I left my family and I used their money for the wrong things. And I was left hungry. There were days where I didn't have enough money to, for food. It was bad. I experienced, I think I needed to experience that because when I was hungry, I suddenly understood something. I suddenly understood how much I miss God, how much I need Him in my life. So I started reading the Bible again. That was the first step I took to, to reconcile myself with God and to rebuild my relationship with Him. And I read the Bible every day. And you know, something interesting happens when you start reading the Bible. You know, the Word of God is so strong. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It pierces even the soul and the bone and the marrow. And it pierced my soul to the deepest parts of it. And it revealed to me the sin that I was living in. I needed to get rid of that sin. I couldn't live with a godly life if I had that sin in my life. And I made the decision after two years of being in that relationship to confront him, to come on my knees and beg for forgiveness. And I just started crying. I was like, God, if the life I'm living, if there's some sin in it, if having sex out of marriage is sin, you need to show me. Because I was already so confused. I didn't know what was right and what was wrong. I lost my way. A few weeks after that, right at, after the festival of Purim, the Feast of Esther, I went to this church called Church of the City. And at that church, uh, the pastor was talking about sexual immorality and about how Paul wrote a letter to the church of Theatera uh, about their sexual immorality and how you can't live with that sexual sin in your life and still have a godly lifestyle and have a relationship with God. And that's the moment I knew I, I, couldn't, I couldn't deny it anymore. This lovely woman who was uh, helping me out at the time and uh, I went to a few of her Bible studies in New York. She went up the stairs and I followed her and I said, she's the only one I trust that she can pray with me right now. Because I felt like every, anybody else would judge me. So I went up after her and I confessed everything to her. And um, she prayed that I would have the boldness to face my former boyfriend and tell him everything that God has done in my life now. And I did, the next day I called my boyfriend and I told him, listen, I can't live this way anymore. And I can't have sex out of marriage. It was the highest price for me to pay because that was the one thing I didn't want to give up in my life. That was the one thing I couldn't give up was love, was true love. I couldn't give that up. And I finally did. I said, I, I can't, if you don't want to be with me, I understand, but I want you to come to church with me. And he hung up on the phone on me at that very moment. And you know, I had a broken heart for months. But God healed my broken heart. And he healed me physically and spiritually. And all the things in the past that affected me, they all happened so I can today share this story with you. No matter what situation you are in right now and what you're facing, it's never too late to turn back and to turn to God. And if you've never had a relationship with God or if you've never known Him or if you've never heard about Him, let me tell you something. Yeshua the Messiah came here on earth and died for our sins so we wouldn't have to live without our Father, Abba, our God. So we can have a personal relationship with Him. This will be the best decision of your life, so please, whatever you're going through, whatever idols you put in front of you before God, the true God, Yeshua, 
just turn to him and he'll come straight into your heart. Just open your heart to him and he'll come into your heart right now in the name of Yeshua, I pray. Wherever you are right now, whether you're seeing this on your phone or you're sitting in your living room or on your bed, I just pray that the Holy Spirit will come in to your house and touch your heart. That you may have uh, the knowledge of how much God loves you. He loves you so much. And He just wants a personal relationship with you. Thank you for listening in. I hope you made this life-changing decision today. So we're here today with uh, Stephen Khoury. It's a pleasure to have you here, Stephen. Thank you, Liron. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Can you introduce yourself? Just tell me a little bit about yourself, yeah. about uh, where you came from, your childhood. Yeah. Um, uh, I was born in the city of Jerusalem. Uh, and I grew up part of my life in Bethlehem, part of my life in the, the, the city of David of Jerusalem. Oh, nice. uh, I tell people as far as I can go back in my recollection, I cannot remember a single day in my life of world peace. I grew up seeing bloodshed, turmoil, anger, hatred, animosity. Uh, and I grew up in this society, in this culture, which taught me uh, life is short. Uh, and I tell people everywhere I go around the world to live life to the fullest, honoring God first and then honoring those whom you love next because you can be here one moment, you can be gone the next. That's the reality of life. Um, so I grew up in a home uh, under a pastor, a, pa a PK, pastor's kid. Yeah. Um, a, the first in his lineage of 800 years of Orthodox Christians in the old city of Jerusalem. My father grew up on the Via Dolorosa. Yeah. Uh, so when he came to a personal relationship with Jesus to become a born again, uh, the term is, um, he's seen as a traitor. Uh, he was seen as uh, somebody that betrayed the faith. Can you dive into a little bit of how, what did God do personally in your life that captivated you, that made you personally have a relationship with Him? Yeah, such, such a good question, uh, Liran. I, um, at a young age, I was uh, cleaning a Sunday school classroom. I was maybe around 10 and a half uh, years old and a PK, as I mentioned. So I grew up learning the Bible and going to Sunday school, but there was something missing in my life as a young boy. Yeah. And I remember I was cleaning a Sunday school classroom and there was a crumpled piece of paper laying uh, under um, in, in, in a corner and under some of the benches in the Sunday school class. I picked up this piece of paper and I unwrapped it and I blew the dust off of this paper. And I'll never forget this, there was a, a little kid's handwriting with John 3.16. Wow. And I read that verse uh, as a young Arab boy. I uh, read this verse and I remember I, I started to tear up and to weep even as a young boy because that paper I resembled it to my life. What do I mean by that? Uh, inside that paper was a great verse. Inside my heart was a great uh, savior, Yeshua. I, I, knew, I knew him, he's, he's in my heart. But I, I looked at this paper and I resembled that just like this paper is covered by the dust of the world, I was covered by the daily, you know, playing my bike, going out with friends as a young boy, even though it was a tough childhood, but still I was doing, I was busy with what every other kid did. I remember I got on my knees and I said, Lord, would you blow the dust off of me? I want to wow. be cleansed from the outside. I want to be, a, I might have not used those specific words, cleansed and purified, but that was what I was saying, Lord, I want to be fully sold out to you. And, and I remember I got off my knees at that, at that time, a, uh, that paper in my hand, crumbled piece of paper, unwrapped. And I said, inside my heart was a great savior. Inside this verse was a great verse, inside this paper. And I said, I want to go out and be. And I remember that sort of put me, I had to choose black or white. I had to choose, uh, I can't uh, play around with both sides of the world. Yeah. Uh, again, I was a young boy, but still it's, I, uh, from young age, I set myself in a position to take that, to be serious about my relationship with Jesus. Yeah. And that started my life to, to my next level. Where I started to see my father being attacked, being beaten for the faith because he preached love and forgiveness that we as Arabs, Arab believers, we have to have love for both the Jews and the Arabs and non-political statement, non-political agenda, just Christ yeah. says, love thy neighbor as thyself, to love yeah. your enemies and so forth. Um, and that led me to uh, start to share my faith with the Muslim community. Wow. What do you think your biggest struggle as a believer was uh, growing up? As an Arab believer growing up in the city of Bethlehem in Jerusalem, the biggest struggle for me was f knowing where I belong. 
knowing where I fit in the community. So I went to school mm -hmm. being called son of a traitor, wow. son of an evangelist, son of a proselyzer, because my father, again, was a man that taught yeah. uh, love and forgiveness and grace to the other side of the fence. Wow. And he promoted peace and taught that. And that was frowned upon as looked at as weakness, as, as, a, as a, you're a traitor to the cause. The other struggle was uh, not only fitting in, but also uh, overcoming fear. Yeah. Uh, you know, when I walk in the street, there's always people uh, with their desire in their hearts to cause damage. A young Muslim came to us wanting to learn about Jesus as a young, as a young person. Yeah. And he came from a very large Muslim family. Wow. And he was hungry to learn the truth. He came to us with the question is, what is, which God do I worship and what's the truth? Who was Jesus and in, in compared to, to Muhammad? And, and, I, and we just taught who Jesus was and let the others, let him work out with the rest of the Holy Spirit and who Muhammad is and everything from his own perspective. Mm -hmm. and I remember uh, after two weeks, he disappeared. So his mother found his Bible, his Arabic Bible. Wow. She found all the side notes. He would write notes on the side of the Bible. And she gave the Bible to his uncles. And his uncles, they, he woke up in the morning, his uncles were standing right above his bed. And they had unwinded a metal hanger and they began to beat him and lash him over and over and over again, calling him, uh, uh, calling him names, like betraying the family and so forth. And oh. uh, they said he's been brainwashed. So they said, we need to find the people that are really causing this damage. And I remember I was walking down the church street towards our church in, in Bethlehem, the Bethlehem loca location. And somebody comes up to me and says, are you Stephen in Arabic? I said, yes, I am. And when I turned around, I, I realized there's something burning in the back of my head after he asked me that question. I said, for something burning in the back of my head, and I turned around, there's about five or six guys there with metal chains and thick wooden sticks in their hands. Wow. And they began to beat me to the ground, beat me over and over and over and over again, call me names like infidel and traitor. Until today, I can remember their eyes, their smiles, their, their teeth, their mustache, that are laughing as I'm beating me to the ground. To the ground. I, I hear their voices. Wow. But I remember I tell people this. I said, Lord, you get me through this. I love you. I'll serve you more. <laughs> I tell people I literally felt like a white blanket just draped over my body. I, I saw the white blanket drape over me wow. and I was at peace. Wow. I tell people I've never experienced that much peace in my life as that 30, 40 seconds of being viciously beaten by wooden sticks and metal chains to the ground. I've never experienced that much peace in my life. And I, 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 remember, I tell people that experience with a white blanket just draped over me. I was conscious because I remember, I remember their smiles, their yeah. eyes, their mustaches. What it did, it ultimately made me realize the psalmist, uh, what it says in the psalm prayer, where it says, even if I lay my bed in the pit of hell, thou art there with me also. Even if I lay my bed in the highest of heavens, thou art with me also. It, it reminded me that there's no place yeah. where God's presence can't reach me either. Um, what it also did made me realize that we have a covenant God. Yeah. That we have a God that's always there for us. We have a God that's, that's always standing with us. And, and this beating, what it was intended was to break me. Yeah. But all this beating did, it wrapped me with the arms of love of God and it made me a stronger believer. I tell people I would not be the person I am today if it wasn't for that beating. I wouldn't be the person I am today. Yeah. So growing up, some of my fears were, um, a, you know, the fears of the unknown. But at yeah. the same time, the unknown and the promises of God became the, my greatest strength and my greatest ability yeah. to be the man I am today. Yeah. Uh, and that's to be in the hands and feet of Jesus, uh, to love others regardless of who they are, regardless of how different they are, to love yeah. them and to walk the journey with them to, to help them understand the relationship with Jesus. Can you share about your love to the Jewish people yeah. and why, where that comes from? Yeah. Liran, such a great question because um, my father, as a young boy, was taught that one day, um, you know, the Jews will be all killed and thrown in the Red Sea and the Red, the sea will become red. Wow. Uh, and he, that never settled within his spirit. And of course, when he started to learn the Bible on a deeper level, he understood that the God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. The God of the Israel is the God of, of the New Testament. Same God speaking different manners, different forms, different shape in different ways to the generations. Yeah. Um, not only that, Jesus Christ was a Jew. This is a non-political statement. This is a factual statement. Christ comes from the lineage of Judah, the seed of Jesse, the tribe of Judah. Um, Mary was a Jew, Joseph was a Jew. So, <clears throat> and then to go deeper, my father always taught Christ to be a good disciple. Mm -hmm. You must love your enemies. Yeah. So he, he, he said that and he would say, my Jews are my, my father always say, I only have one enemy, that's Satan. Yeah. But he, he made that wide spectrum. Christ said two things, to love thy Lord thy God with all our might, heart, and strength, and to love thy neighbor as ourselves. Yeah. He always speak 
Jesus says, love your enemies. Yeah. So he did both spectrum because one, one might say, well, I don't have an enemy. Well, then why aren't you loving your neighbor? Yeah. So no, nobody can escape <laughs> from, from the teach from those yeah. two aspects of Christ. So I grew up in this essence of I see a Jew, I see a Muslim, I see a human being, a cause worth winning versus it putting them in a category and so forth. Unfortunately, most people don't have that. Many Arab evangelical Christians have this thing uh, where it's a replacement theology or yeah. animosity or hatred towards the Jewish people. And, and I blame them and I don't blame them. I blame yeah. them because they need to be better human beings and I don't blame them because that's all they know is uh, anger, animosity, hatred, and bitterness, and revenge. That's the culture. That's the nature of human being. And that's what they see on TV. That's what they're taught in the schools. Yeah. And when you take a non-political message and approach, you win a lot of people. Because yeah. people, people look at me and I say, I love the Jewish people. This is not a political uh, uh, statement or a cause. It's a biblical cause. Jesus Christ, yeah. love you. Are the Jewish people perfect? 100% no. Mm. Are the Arabs perfect? 100% no. Yeah. But in their imperfectness, do I have the right to judge them all? And that is a real question, and yeah. I and we know the answer is no. Yeah. Uh, so that is my that is where my love for the Muslims and the Jewish people comes yeah. in, is the love of a Abba Father who who said to love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah, Amen. That's uh, that's so true, and I think growing up here, you kind of realize on both sides of the spectrum, there's that there is that kind of pain that hurt. Uh, people lose family members. Um, and and there's a lot of uh, distance and friction yeah. because of that, and uh, people. It's natural. I mean, it's, it's natural. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of pain there that's just been residing there for years. Yeah. It's something that only God can heal us yeah. of that. And that's right. Both sides, no matter where you're you're coming from, we want peace. Uh, we just want to live in peace. Yeah, that's and, right. And uh, that's good. And the only way for that to really happen is with God. So yep. that's that's amazing. Well, it's been a pleasure to have you, Stephen, and it's been awesome to hear how much God is doing through your ministry and uh, just through you. Leron, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. This is from Isaiah 40, verse 9. O Zion, you who bring good tidings, get up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem, you who bring good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up, be not afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Al har gava alilach mevaseret Zion. Harimi bekoach kolech mevaseret Yerushalayim. Harimi alti rei imri le arei Yehuda ine elohechem. 